week on Quadriga. Make or break for the euro, what's the plan? Is the crisis in the eurozone spreading? And what can be done to keep Greece in the single currency? These are the questions Europe's politicians need to answer, but different countries are offering different remedies. Germany wants the emphasis on cutting public spending and controlling debt. But the leaders of France and Italy say the problem of deficits can't be solved without growth. Meanwhile, Greece seems poised on the brink of default and perhaps departure from the euro. Your host on today's show is Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome. So does Europe have a plan? The old one looks to be falling apart. Heads of state met this week for dinner and some will certainly have gone away with indigestion. What wasn't on the menu was a Greek exit from the euro, but that was most certainly on people's minds. And what was very much on the table was the discussion of austerity versus growth. We want to find out what's on the minds of three Berlin-based journalists who've been following the story closely. And they are Ulrike Hermann. She's opinion page editor for the Berlin-based newspaper Die Tageszeitung, and she previously worked in the banking sector. Stefano Cassetano is a columnist for the Italian business newspaper Linchiesta. He's also worked as an advisor to the Italian Ministry of Economic Development, and he's currently a senior fellow at the Brandenburg Institute for Society and Security. And Theo Kovacas was Berlin-based correspondent for the Greek media outlet Real Media. He's now writing for the weekly paper Paraskevi Kai Dekatris. And I'd like to start with you, Theo Kovacas, and ask you to be an oracle, if you would, please. Uh, we have ongoing turbulence in your country. What's your prognosis for the upcoming elections? Will they produce a stable government in Greece? Well, the situation is quite fluid. So we have three weeks in which things might change this way or the other way. If things remain as they are right now, we might have a government, a coalition government, uh, looks, according to the polls, looks most probable that uh, the lefts will have the first position, so they will have uh, a 50 seat bonus to build a government. Uh, but it uh, mainly, I think it mainly depends on what the rest of Europe is going to send as a signal to the Greek voters. How so? Whether, uh, for example, uh, Mr. Lanz or Mr. Venizelos. Uh, a few days ago in That's Paris. The new French president. The uh, new French president, so the, uh, the, the president of the Socialist Party in Greece, uh, which was in power up to a few months ago. Uh, that definitely is making Greek voters believe that, yes, okay, France will help if we vote for them, for the socialists. In the same way, if uh, Greek voters have a, take the message, receive the message that nobody's going to help them, that they, all they want is, or the rest of the Europeans, all they want is austerity and uh, uh, kicking people out of the public sector and uh, eventually forcing Greece out of the euro, uh, then it's quite normal that they will vote in extremis. <laughs> Ulrike Hermann, the leader of the Greek uh, left, Alexis Tsipras, was here in Berlin this week. He was making something of a European tour, in fact. You went to his press conference. What was your impression? Well, my impression was that he was really very cautious and that he uh, tried not to say anything radical that might annoy the other European governments. Of course, it's known that Mr. Tsipras wants to stop the austerity programs and that he wants to renegotiate everything that was agreed on uh, so far. But that is something that he didn't stress, you know. He's, instead, he tried to sell to the German public that it was in the German interest to stop the austerity programs in Greece. So he always tried to somehow uh, build a coalition between the Greek public or the Greek uh, um, people and the German people. He tried to somehow make believe that there is no conflict of interests. Meanwhile, uh, the German media world was calling him the George Clooney of Greece. <laughs> yeah, it's true. He's very good looking. And it is a chance for Greece that he is only 37 years old so that he is a new generation. He does not belong to this political elite that somehow uh, caused the whole ruin of Greece. He is a newcomer, and that itself is a chance. But of course, it's true that he, and that's a problem, he does not admit so far 
that any reforms in Greece are necessary. You know, listening to him, you have the impression that for some strange reason, Greece is now in trouble, but that it all is all uh, somehow um, uh, the responsibility of the Europeans to get Greece out of the mess. And I'd say uh, it's, you know, uh, um, that is only half of the truth. Of course, uh, the euro is not really const uh, not uh, constructed in a a good way, so Greece went into trouble. But on the other hand, it's also true that Greece is not a market economy. It's uh, you only have, That's you, true. yeah you, uh, everything is uh, uh, there is no competition at all. No? Stefano Casatano, another of the week's events was that Angela Merkel, uh, while the leftist leader was visiting here, she was telephoning with the head of the caretaker government. There was a rumor that she had said there ought to be a referendum on whether Greece stays in the euro that could be held simultaneously with the vote in June. Then, of course, the uh, chancellor re retracted uh, that and said that it wasn't true. But in the end, doesn't this vote in June amount to a referendum about whether Greece stays in the Eurozone or not? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it might, sign, uh, it might sound as a referendum. And there is also um, a problem concerning this uh, decision, this possibility that uh, uh, Angela Merkel actually mentioned. And the main problem is that it might sound like a solution to avoid bearing the responsibility of uh, kicking Greece out of the Euro. Because, uh, in the end, Angela Merkel could basically um, maintain the position that uh, the Greeks decided for themselves. And there is going to be a huge economic catastrophe uh, if Greece exits the euro. And uh, if the referendum um, has uh, taken this direction, Angela could basically make uh, the Greeks responsible for that. Theo Kouvakis, I'm looking to you to see if you're nodding. Uh... Yeah, I, I totally agree. and I. I'm quite convinced that uh, the way that uh, the German government is treating the Greek problem right now is a way of forcing Greek voters to vote for people who, as the German government thinks, will take Greece out of the euro. Uh, which I don't think is the case because... What do you think the Greek people want? If such a referendum were held, if the referendum were on the euro itself and whether to remain... On the latest poll, we had 70% pro-euro. 70% in, uh, in, a, in a situation uh, that looks like a catastrophe, okay? Uh, mind you, I, Tsipras has never been a radical leftist. So he's not pro uh, leaving the Euro or getting out of the Euroland or the European Union. Uh, he's done a very bad marketing job letting the rest of Europe understand what he's telling the Greeks, and that's why they voted for him. You know, it was uh, an overwhelming uh, second place that he had. Uh, what he basically says is, OK, there are lots of wrong things in Greece. Uh, there's corruption, there is incompetence, there are dinosaur politicians who keep on trying to hold the power, etc., etc. OK, we have to change all that, but we cannot do that by creating a nation of desperate, uh, hungry and sick people who will not have any chance of hoping for something in the future. That's what he says practically, which is what most politicians who are not in power in Europe say. OK, it's easier to say it. That's what they do. Let's take a look at what Greece's departure from the euro might mean. Some people talk about it being a Lehman Brothers moment, a tipping point for the entire world economy. But could Greece even leave the euro? Here's a closer look. Greece cannot be thrown out of the euro. There is no provision in the treaties for that to happen. But if the crisis continues and other countries end their financial support, Athens could decide it would be better off outside the single currency. An exit would have to be prepared in secret and announced suddenly. Otherwise, even more cash would find its way out of Greece. In any case, there would almost certainly be a run on the banks, and some banks would surely collapse. As credit became unavailable, businesses would go bust, unemployment would rise further, and some goods would become scarce. There could be chaos on the streets. A new currency would be introduced, 
a major practical problem in itself because banknotes cannot be produced at short notice. And the new money would lose value, stoking inflation. Eventually, Greece's exports could get a boost because they would suddenly be much cheaper than before, and the economy might begin to recover. Whatever happens, the concern will remain that if Greece leaves the euro, other countries could follow. Before we delve into the details of what all of that might look like, let's uh, start out with that last projection, Stefano Casertano, because one of those other countries is thought to be Italy. Do you see a potential Greek exit from the euro as a Lehman Brothers moment, as something that would become a contagious epidemic that could lead the entire eurozone to collapse? Indeed. We shall not stick to the mere economic calculation. So I think that an exit of uh, Greece might be, in the end, bearable on the economic side. The problem is political. Take the example of the Argentinian default years ago. It's still mentioned in Italy as an example of a country that defaulted, and uh, it, uh, it ended up to be better off. And uh, so people say, let's exit the euro. Then let's do that. Greece and Italy are very different in terms of uh, integration with uh, the world economy, in terms of dimension overall. Yet, uh, Italians might take it as, a, as an example and will say, let's do it, let's do it. And then uh, um, Spain might say, let's do it. Then France might say, let's do it. So if you take uh, the Greek exit, you're going to have the full package. That's the problem. Then let's start uh, looking at some of the factors that can lead to c contagion, some of the problematic factors that were mentioned in that report, starting with the bank run, Ulrike Hammann, already happening, isn't it? Yeah, there is a bank run in all of Europe, except for Germany, in fact. I mean, the Greeks, they have already transferred most of the money to uh, the German banks or to other banks they regard as safe. That the banks in Greece have not yet collapsed is just due to the rescue programs by the ECB. It, it, the ECB tunnels or gives money to the Greek banks all the time. It's, it amounts to about 100 billion euro by now, what, which the Greek banks got from the ECB. And then, but it's not only bank run in Greece, you also have a bank run in Italy and in Spain and in Portugal, because even now people already start thinking, OK, if uh, it's possible or if there's a permanent talk about uh, the Greeks leaving the euro, then of course it might hit Italy or Spain. So many Spaniards, many Italians, they start uh, uh, transferring their money to Germany as well. In fact, you know, all the European money is now being collected by, <laughs> by German banks and has to be transferred back via the ECB into these countries, which means that in the end, all the risks with the German uh, banking um, system, which is not sustainable. So I think in a very short run, without anyone noticing, we will have the Eurobond to end this kind of a capital flight that is extreme. I mean, it's, it amounts to trillions by now. Okay. I'm still going to leave the Eurobond yeah. to the side okay. for now, because once we get into the Eurobond discussion, we're yeah. going to have a hard time getting out. And I'd like to briefly stay with this scenario that we yeah. just looked at. Theo Kubakas, what are your own relatives in Greece doing? Have they taken their money out of the country? How are they preparing for this massive uncertainty and risk? Frankly, my own relatives have had to use their savings for the last in the last years in order to survive so they don't have any money to bring to germany uh, i know of people who have done it i have friends who have done it i have lots of friends who ask me whether they should uh, i don't think it's an easy situation and uh, definitely it's not a matter of political decisions whether a bank run well, this bank walk that we have right yeah, no, now it's will, a bank walk, yes. will, will transform into a bank run, but it's definitely a symptom, it's not the problem, and we are still not dealing with the basic problem, which is how the euro was created, how the eurozone was created, and whether we have a European Union or it's only European and not much of a union. Stefano Cassetano, your own country, Italy, has suggested that there needs to be deposit insurance, uh, tighter deposit insurance regulations all across Europe. Would that go some way to help prevent contagious, uh, uh, this contagious bank run that Ulrike Hammond described? Yes, I think that uh, the solution is um, just a, so to say, financial patch to solve a symptom. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. 
and won't solve the actual core of the problem. Why is that? Um, I had something on this point, about this point. Uh, the problem is uh, the strategy that has been decided to solve the crisis, because uh, fiscal discipline without reforms creates depression. By the way, this is not what Germany did around 2004 to become so successful. From 2001 to 2005, Germany was running budgetary deficit every single year beyond Maastricht, and they reformed. Now they're asking other countries just to increase taxes, to lower the deficit, and uh, reforms are not in the agenda of Angela Merkel. They're just mentioned like on the side. So that's the formula for disaster. Yeah, no, totally. That's exactly what I was saying. Since we have a monetary union without a fiscal and economic policy union, then it's inevitable that you have competitiveness gaps from the small ones to the big ones, transferring competitiveness from Greece and Italy and Spain and Portugal towards Germany and France. So the whole thing can't work. What do you have to do? You have to sit down and, and first of all, make institutions that could work. Okay, we've got the European Union, let's elect the government of, the Euro of Europe. But Ulrike Hammond, isn't that actually what Angela Merkel is trying to do with her proposal for the fiscal pact for an agreement that would give much, much tighter restrictions on what national governments can do in terms of incurring debt and that would give the EU itself certain oversight into national budgets? Well, the good thing about the fiscal pact is, of course, that it is a kind of a unification of this fiscal policy. The really severe problem with this fiscal pact is that it uh, prolongs austerity towards infinite future. That would be, it would mean austerity every year in all countries. And if everyone saves all the time, of course, you are uh, plunging into a recession and uh, Europe, in fact, is on the verge of not a recession but a depression. It's really very dangerous uh, to just have austerity programs. And uh, a thing that is not really um, approached is, of course, this question of competitiveness. And I think that um, it was Germans' fault, mainly, that many uh, countries in Europe are no longer competitive because what we did was to uh, drive down our uh, real wage costs. So everyone else, just as it is supposed to be, uh, raised the wages according to inflation and productivity. Only Germany tried to uh, lower the wages in, in real costs in order to be more competitive. And now this is really very dangerous because it affects not only Italy or Greece or Portugal, even France is no longer able to compete against Germany. Now France is our, uh, the most important country in the euro when viewed from uh, Germany. So if we lose France as a partner, you can just forget the eurozone. So I think it, what one should talk about is not this uh, fiscal pact or austerity. What you really should talk about is how you somehow um, get uh, wages to develop um, uh, in accordance in all countries. Stefano Cassertano, there's been some discussion the last couple of weeks in Germany about whether allowing a bit more inflation here yeah. might go part of the way to evening out the imbalance in competitiveness mm -hmm. by, of course, making German labor somewhat more expensive mm -hmm. and other countries' labor comparatively more reasonable. Is that a real um, potential solution, would you say? And do you mm -hmm. believe the talk that Germany would allow such a thing? This is a country that's been allergic to inflation in the past. Yeah, I, I think that's the point. Uh, inflation is a taboo in, uh, in Germany and the inflation won't help wages to rise, quite the opposite. Um, the point is that basically the euro is more of a political problem rather than a financial or economic problem. So now it's going to be, to be decided whether Europe is gonna, going to become a continental nation. So if Germany wants to bear the responsibility of developing a European monetary union with a leadership, this might be the point, and they have to care about wages in Germany as well as wages in Italy, Spain, Greece, so foreign markets for uh, German goods. I see you over there shaking your head, Ulrike Herrmann. You don't agree? No, it's, I think it's completely wrong to say that the Euro, uh, the Euro crisis is just a political crisis. It is an economic crisis. and It's, it's both. Yeah, but it's very important to solve also the economic side of the problem because otherwise it will just crash. And the main problem is the competitiveness 
I mean, Italy just can't compete against Germany anymore, which, which is really a problem for Italy and Germany, bo uh, both of them. And of course, the solution would be an inflation in Germany. But uh, And you're right, the Germans are, uh, uh, don't uh, hate inflation because of the history. And what is really alarming are the inflation rates that we had, um, uh, the statistics of the inflation rates that were just released this week. There you can see. And that's really horrible that the inflation rate in Germany is the lowest in, uh, in the whole of Europe and that Greece, despite being in a recession, still has a higher inflation rate in Germany. In Italy, just the same. You are in a recession and nonetheless the prices in Italy rise quicker than in Germany. This means that Italy and Greece, being in a crisis, still lose their competitiveness against Germany. So the crisis deepens. It is not at all solved. But now he is uh, <laughs> somehow complaining. <laughs> no, no, please. Uh, 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 I'd like to take a closer look at the whole discussion about which remedies and which uh, particular solutions should be part of a new plan to solve the crisis. Because the fact is which remedies you favor depends very much on how you define the problem. We've already seen, seen here in our discussion how difficult that is, equally difficult for European leaders. They met this week for dinner. As I mentioned, there was undoubtedly a lot of indigestion as they were going home because agreement on those remedies is very hard indeed. Chancellor Angela Merkel believes the answer to the troubles in the Eurozone is the fiscal pact, signed by 25 countries in March. It's intended to make governments concentrate on reducing deficits. But many politicians now doubt that the fiscal pact alone is the solution. What's needed, they say, are stimulus measures to ensure that austerity doesn't cut off the oxygen of the economy and make the problem worse. The new French president, François Hollande, is calling for the introduction of eurobonds. That would mean weaker countries' debt would be guaranteed by stronger economies like Germany. So far, Berlin has been vehemently opposed to the idea. Other proposals are also controversial, such as using emergency funds to prop up banks or a tax on financial transactions. Everyone accepts that economic reform is essential, but without German support, no idea is likely to succeed. Theo Kouvakis, some concessions are now being made on growth. There's talk of expanding the role of the European Investment Bank. There's talk of more investment in infrastructure, structural assistance, and so on. Would any or all of that truly pump oxygen into the Greek economy, to use the phrase there in the report, in time to help people in desperate circumstances there? It would definitely pump some oxygen, but I don't know if it would be in time, and I don't know if it would be enough. Uh, the system in Greece is, is a an stone age system, okay? Uh, let's suppose that uh, the European Union decides to pump some uh, structural funds, and some uh, growth money to Greece. Who's going to manage that? Who's going to dispense that? Who's going to choose which projects should get money and should not? Since the European Union institutions never did what they should do, which would be to control what is going on in uh, country members and how things work, and that's how things got out of hand, there's no mechanism to pump money into the Greek economy and definitely there's no confidence. So even if you offer free money to people, they would not take the risk of uh, getting involved in something which they are not confident that has some chances of success, which is the same thing, uh, which is a problem with the rest of Europe, because we're talking about decisions. Okay, we never talk about the European citizens, which sooner or later will come to the vote and decide whether they like this European Union that we have or not. And I'm, I'm afraid they would not like much, much of what is happening. They will not approve of what is happening. Stefano Casatano, the fact is that in the past, some of these remedies in terms of investment, structural assistance and so on, they've been there and Greece has not availed itself of them. 
Um, there is a very interesting uh, article that was published last year uh, uh, on the New York Times, uh, and um, it concerned a comparison between uh, state aid or European uh, investment uh, where compared to oil revenue, creating corruption, uh, creating uh, like courts of people just trying to get access to these natural resources, so to say. And in the end, uh, it doesn't create uh, the condition for a systematic growth of the economy, for a systematic uh, wealth, just uh, a structure of people and of an economy trying to seek access to these uh, revenue sources. So what would do so? Uh, reforms. I mean, reforms. I mean, I don't think the solution... We say that word as if it's a magic talisman. Which reforms? <laughs> the reforms How? are... Who the point is that the, the solution of Europe is not to make... German, Germany less competitive by raising wages. In my opinion, the solution is to make the rest of uh, Europe more similar to Germany. <laughs> Allow them to implement the reforms that have been carried on here some 10 years ago. And then allow to create a, a modern structure of the labor market, a modern structure of the social state, a modern structure of uh, competitiveness. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have uh, 30% uh, unemployment and so on. And we would just uh, have a few people working with higher wages and a lot of unemployed people. Yeah, excuse no, me but about if that. You, no, but if no. you follow this, this recipe, that this would mean that whole of Europe, except for Germany, would have to uh, reduce its wages by 20 to 30%. Now, this really means a very deep recession. Now, I think it would be much better if Germany met the other countries halfway by uh, raising its own wages. No? If Germany raised the wages, if there was some inflation, then the others would only have to reduce the wages by, let's say, 10 to 15 percent and not by, by 20 to 30 percent. And um, that would, I think, be the much better recipe. It's a, it's a trade-off between uh, inflation and unemployment. That's, uh, uh, of course, uh, a, a very classical take on, uh, on, uh, on economic theory. But uh, I must say, in the case of Germany, uh, there is a, this is something that cannot be deployed, simply because in uh, lands like uh, Bavaria, mm -hmm. you have unemployment that's uh, less than 4%. Yes. And in Berlin, which is the most unemployed land in Germany, you have 12.5%, which is physiological, I would say, nobody is ever going to bear the burden for such a transformation, also because I'm very concerned, I'm very skeptical about the fact that it's going to help other countries to develop. Also, the other question for me is, aren't we in another vicious circle here? Uh, we say reform, reform, reform. Who is supposed to implement and carry mm -hmm. out those reforms in a country like yours, Theo Kovacos, where there's no effective government? Mm, well, I agree, totally agree, and I, I don't agree only on national level, but I agree on a European level. Because reforms in Europe have been um, promised and written down and signed more than once. Okay? In Maastricht there were reforms, in uh, Lisbon there were reforms, in Paris there were reforms. They were not implemented because Europe has a main disadvantage, it has no leadership. And, it, and, and the European executive, which is uh, appointed and not, not uh, voted, elected, uh, have no authority. So let's have a look and see what do we need in order to implement reforms in Europe. Maybe we need a, a cohesive strategy which we don't have. And maybe we need another institution that will help Europe act and, and evolve as a unit and not as little bits and pieces which work or might not work. Some again would argue that the fiscal, fiscal pact is the beginning of a process that might begin to go in that direction. But let us now move on to the discussion that I promised uh, that we've been holding in reserve, namely the euro bond discussion. That of course has been the topic of the past few weeks. It flared up again just before this dinner of heads of state this week uh, with Angela Merkel saying eurobonds would not contribute to growth. And with the head of the European Parliament, on the other hand, Ulrike Hermann saying, on a day when Germany issues bonds with zero percent interest and other countries are borrowing money at six percent, we know something is wrong with the system and eurobonds is the way to fix it. Where do you stand? 
Well, I think that we will have the, uh, the Eurobond, uh, or, uh, or it's the alternative. Either we will have a Eurobond uh, quite soon, or the Euro will crash. Because just as you mentioned, we have two problems. One is this bank run uh, happening in whole of Europe, that the private investors take the money from the banks in the uh, native countries and uh, uh, transfer the money to Germany. So this is the private uh, level. And then we have the state level, where just as you mentioned, Germany doesn't pay any interest rates anymore, and the others have to pay 7%, like almost 7% like Italy or Spain. This will not, is not sustainable at all. And you know what uh, Europe needs is really a sign that everyone believes in, that Europe wants to stay together. You know, it's all a crisis, as uh, Mr. Kovacs said, of trust. Now, and this sign of trust can only be the Eurobond, because the, all of these rescue packages that we had now amount to, to 1 billion euro didn't work, because everyone knows, uh, no, 1 trillion, everyone knows 1 trillion is not enough to rescue Europe. Now, the ECB put 1 trillion euro into the European banks. It didn't help. Now, so the, uh, just uh, putting up rescue packages won't work anymore. Um, anything else, just having summits without any results doesn't help. The only thing, you really need to take action. And there are just two things to do. Um, you have to have Eurobond, one common bond for all of Europe, and the ECB must be allowed to buy these Eurobonds. Now, this seems to be revolutionary for the Europeans, but it is just the ordinary structure of every other country in this world. For example, the United States, they have a Fed, which buys the bonds of the government, and, or UK, or Japan. It's completely normal that the central bank buys the bonds of its own government. Only Europe doesn't have this kind of structure. And that's why it doesn't work. The difference, of course, Stefano Cassatano, <laughs> and there we would be back to your definition of the problem as essentially a political one, is that in the US, a political consciousness has evolved of being all citizens of one country. Yeah, there, is, really. there is a political solidarity in the US that has evolved over more than two centuries. <laughs> that is not the case in Europe. Mm -hmm. This week we saw a very controversial German politician saying that for Germans to bear the debt of other southern European countries is akin to them still paying war reparations. That's how unfair some Germans see this. What's your response to such arguments? Uh, I apologize, but I, I would like not to comment on the opinion of uh, Tilo Sarrazin because uh, I think it's very inappropriate. Uh, he made a comparison. I won't I wouldn't like to mention. Tito Sarrazin, of course, being the politician I just mentioned. In general, the argument by Germans that it's not fair, that they should have to pay the bill for those who have not tightened their belts. You are perfectly right. I think uh, that morals to achieve a political union might not work. We should talk interest. Mm, and exactly, the point yeah. is that uh, we have two scenarios. Scenario number one. Germany sticks with its, uh, with its uh, autonomous policy, uh, like Victoria and England, and they somehow manage uh, the failure of Europe uh, and they keep their exports to China. They have to pay for the failure of, Union, of, of, of Europe, of course. The second scenario is that they bear the burden of the European debt, they share it, they somehow manage it, and they create a union. So. Personally, I would say the second option is the one with uh, um, the longest uh, um, maybe uh, view and uh, might be also the one they should uh, seek for because Europe is going to be made now. Europe is going to be born within a crisis. Everybody can uh, team up when uh, everything goes well, but if they bear the political responsibility of doing this now, then it's going to work. But you need the political class that's willing to sacrifice. Theo Kouvakis, perhaps it's just the optimist in me, but sometimes I think I see small signs of a slightly evolving European consciousness. We certainly now know the names of political leaders in other countries we never would have known before. That is true. That's absolutely true. But what we lack is uh, a comprehensive and, and really federalistic, not federal, way of thinking for Europe. And that's why we miss so important points, uh, just like the one Stefano said, or just uh, about the U Europe's competitiveness uh, against the rest of the world. We forget about it, and we have a very expensive euro, which is not good for German export, it's not good for Greek exports, or for tourism, or for Italy, or for Spain, for anybody. Because we have taboos, and because we have not 
yet evolved a European consciousness. Okay? We are citizens of Europe, but we think locally. I think it's time we understand that the problem is not lazy Greeks or uh, um, the siesta of the, of the Spanish or whatever. The party-loving Italians. <laughs> or the party-loving Italians. <laughs> what party? The slow food Italians. Mm -hmm. okay. Ulrike Hermann, given all of that, how do you convince Germans? Um, you certainly have given us uh, what amounts to a paradoxical argument for Eurobonds. Many people in your country, of course, very, very reluctant, including the Chancellor. You say the Eurobonds are inevitable. What's going to get Germany from here to there? Yeah, you know, the, the, they have to realize, and I'm sure the Germans will realize, that there is no a cheap option. You know, right now many Germans think that, they, uh, that the Greeks could just exit the Euro or the Italians or whoever without them having any costs. You know, they have this idea that the Euro is somehow like a supermarket and that you <laughs> can buy cheap goods going and that's it. But the problem is that whatever ever happens, every option is very expensive to, for the Germans. Now, of course, if uh, uh, the Greeks and Italians and uh, Spaniards stay in the Euro, the, uh, the Germans will have to accept that they have to ha um, pay for some transfer from the German riches to these countries. But if uh, all these countries left, you know, G Germany would lose billions and billions and billions because all uh, b we had so many exports going to in into these countries, which were, of course, financed by debts. Now, uh, but that each debt is also um, the wealth of someone, you know? So if, if all these countries were no longer able to pay that German, the debts they have in Germany, many people in Germany would lose a lot of money, billions, even trillions. So, you know, it might be the cheaper option to have a Eurobond. That's at least my opinion. The Eurobond is the cheapest option there is. And I think it will take some time for the Germans to realize that. But once they realize it, they will all be very happy to have a Eurobond. So Ulrike Hammond, <laughs> Ulrike Hammond telling us that all Europeans are already sitting in one boat and they'd better yes, realize it. But yeah. in fact, isn't the world in its entirety in this particular boat, Stefan Casatano. Certainly the world economy now so interlocked through global trade and global financial mm -hmm. uh, streams. What does the rest of the world need to be doing? Let's say we could begin to inch toward euro bonds. Do we also need a bigger firewall, for instance, through the IMF, through the G20? Uh, no more firewalls. <laughs> it's, it's enough. <laughs> so, uh, because uh, the market understands of the size of the firewall, understands of the size of the rescue fund, uh, writes it uh, into in the Excel program, and then they basically change their investment options, and it's done. And the uh, <laughs> taxpayer are going to pay for that. I would say what we have, uh, something we have to hope and something we have to do. The things we have to hope is that China, please keep on growing. Uh, mm. Because <laughs> if China stops now, then the German experts are going to have problems, then German employment is going to have problems, and then Europe breaks much sooner. The second thing we have to do is, and uh, I agree with Ulrike now, <laughs> please. Oh, for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> go on. Uh, it's not for the first time. Come on. Come on. <laughs> let's uh, go on with uh, continental political uh, unification. Because the original plan of the euro, as Germany had thought of it, was to create a uh, a, um, a euro with a political union. France refused to do that because they didn't want to submit, so to say, to Frankfurt. Now it's time to do that. Theo Kovacis, I don't know how long you've been here in Germany. 18 months. 18 <laughs> months, okay. Not long enough to have seen the huge transfers that took place from west to east during the time after the Berlin Wall I followed fell. it as a journalist, I know. When you speak to Germans, do you have the sense that they would be willing to re-embark on such a program in aid of southern Europe? Which Germans? Ex-Western Germans or ex-Eastern Germans? <laughs> Either or both. <laughs> well, it's uh, two different cases because uh, they started from different levels and they are approaching different levels. Western Germans are not very satisfied with the use of their tax uh, the pay, uh, taxes are paid. The Eastern Germans are not very satisfied because they think that too much money has been spent and they still have a big gap on the standard of living towards the Westerners. I don't think it is a matter of trying to, um, to share the little money that we can 
uh, grab with more taxes. I think what we need is real growth and real um, consolidation, economic, financial, political consolidation. That's, I think, it's the only way out. If not, okay, let's give it two years, three years, five years maximum. I don't think it could stand for more. Ulrike Herrmann, is the main thing that we can expect or ask from the rest of the world, and we are looking at a G20 summit coming up, of course, as well, simply that they keep on growing, that they keep that expanding pie moving outward, or are there other things that, for instance, if Europe were to agree to euro bonds, it could ask then from the IMF and the G20? You know, I think that Europe doesn't need the help of the other countries, not because Europe as a whole is very healthy, very strong. It's one of the strongest economies in the world. And of course, we could so solve all our problems ourselves. It's uh, just a question of construction. It's a question of whether you embark on uh, senseless austerity programs. But, uh, you know, uh, all the mistakes are made in Europe itself. And if Europe uh, just stop these mistakes, it could help itself. It is kind of strange that Europe, being so rich, now has the idea that someone else has to help it. You know, it I mean, we are not Africa. And uh, um, I am not against the IMF being uh, 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 part of the uh, rescue packages for Greece, but not because we need the money, but uh, they have um, more um, knowledge about how, uh, how to restructure countries that are in trouble than the Europeans have. But, uh, so it is a, a transfer of knowledge. But what we do, do really not need is a transfer of money. Okay. Very briefly, euro bonds. Ulrike <laughs> Hammond said they are <laughs> inevitable. When? Uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Theo Kovacas? Three months maximum. Ulrike? Yeah, I think this year we'll see them. Okay, many thanks to all of you for being with us today and many thanks to all of you out there for tuning in.